Hey, good afternoon all and welcome to today's compliance webinar, which is all around uh, complaints and appeals today. So I have you on chat so you can pop your chats in the chat box. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, if you, this is an interactive webinar, so you can ask any questions that you may have. If you do, just pop it in the chat box. Uh, and you might want to change it to all panellists on there as well. So we have a few people online today, so it's great to see you online and welcome to this month's webinar. So this month's webinar, we're going through complaints and appeals and we've now combined RTO and CRICOS together. So we now have uh, what is relevant for international students as well as for your domestic market as well. So we've got those combined. Now, the other thing that we're doing today is we're going to have a focus on uh, quality indicators because that is due at the end of this month for your report to be submitted. And there's a few changes uh, this year due to COVID in 2020. So we're gonna be going through uh, the standards for complaints and appeals for both RTO and CRICOS and quality indicator. Uh, and you need to submit your quality indicator report at the end of this month. So it's really important that you have an understanding of what is involved with this whole process. So we're gonna be having a look at the documents as well. So as per usual, this webinar forms part of your continuous improvement process under standard 2.2. And following this webinar, we recommend that you hold a Q&C meeting. And at that Q&C meeting, you discuss the fact that you uh, partake, partook, in this uh, training today. And then what was it that you found that you need to now implement into your systems and practices, or how can you improve your practices within your RTO? You should also review the policies and procedures around complaints and appeals to make sure that they are actually in line with what you should be doing uh, with your complaints and appeals. So as per the policies and procedures for continuous improvement, there may be opportunities for improvement where you need to update your policies and procedures. You should also review any documentation that may relate uh, to this session today. If you have any questions, please pop them in the chat. It's interactive and I love to hear any questions that you may have. If you have some examples of complaints that you have received and you would like to be hot spotted, and that means I'll bring you up as a speaker, we can discuss that as um, on live and we can go through and use that as a, um, uh, a way of being able to interact a bit more. So we also have Kirsten online today. So um, I'm just invited Kirsten in. So Kirsten's our client liaison officer. Hi Kirsten. <laughs> I feel like I've been on webinars all day. <laughs> okay, all right, so welcome. So let's start with quality indicators. Can I have in the chat, um, if you have submitted your quality indicators yet? If you have, I want you to put yes. If you haven't, I would like, like you to place no, just so that I know where you're at and I'm getting you to interact as well. Um, so if you have submitted your quality indicator report, yes, or no? So we've got one no, two no's. No, if you don't know, just put, I don't know. No, first time to do this year, yay. Okay, all right, cool. Um, anybody, anybody else? Uh, do you know what a quality indicator form is? <laughs> that might be another question that we need to answer. We will be going through the form today and what are the requirements? Okay, all right. Um, and if you're a newbie, uh, you won't know this yet. So this will be something new for you. So under the requirements of the data provisioning uh, legislation, every RTO is required to submit a report or a summary of their learner engagement. And there's a survey that they need to complete. Due to the um, extenuating year that we had last year with COVID and lockdowns and things like that, us was determined that it will not take, will not take regulatory action against providers that are unable to submit 
their 2020 quality indicator data. So this might be something that you need to uh, consider if you're unable to. I still recommend that you do if you can, um, uh, but if you haven't, uh, you don't. You, there will be no fines uh, that will happen. Providers are still able to submit their data, but will not face any regulatory action, um, and that's for the current reporting period only. Uh, this is due to the horrendous year that we had last year um, with the issues with uh, lockdown, and there was a lot of other things that we needed to focus on. Um, but if you have got your quality indicators out and you do have the surveys, I do recommend that you do it. The um, main reason why is so that you're doing an evaluation of the data that you've collected. So the data uh, quality indicators is a form that you send out to your students uh, and distribute at least once during the duration of their training. It's something that you should review at your quality and compliance meeting so that you're reviewing the feedback that you've received and how are you going to improve your practices based on that feedback. Um, you need to complete a quality indicator summary report in June year, each year, and that's what we're going to be going through, and it's due um, at the end of this month. So the learner engagement indicator is a document that really focuses on the quality of your education and uh, learners engagement in the activities that are likely to promote high quality skill outcomes. It includes learner perceptions of the quality of their training and assessment and the support they receive from their RTO. So it's getting feedback. So ASQA and uh, NCVER want to get this feedback to identify how is the training industry going and what sort of feedback are you getting and, and how, most importantly, how are you acting on that feedback following um, get receipt of the feedback. So this is a really good source to identify improvements or opportunities for improvement within your organisation and how do you implement that. There is also an employer satisfaction indicator. So this is where you send out a survey to employers to identify, you know, how do they think that their uh, clients or their, sorry, their staff members went going through your training. So how did their learner competency develop to meet their needs and the relevance of learner competencies for work and further training. The overall quality of the training and assessment and how it was delivered and conducted and did it meet the student needs. The source of data is a measure or an indicator of, of how you are going and the quality of the training that you're delivering to meet employer needs. And it's a real uh, good indicator to identify whether um, uh, any opportunities for improvement within your training and assessment. And one of the really important areas with this is really identifying the data that you've collected and how you're going to implement that within your organisation. Now, employer satisfaction surveys are to be completed by employers. So if you're an RTO that mainly serves the public and you don't have any employers that you're engaging with, then you're not required to distribute the employer satisfaction um, indicator. So such as if you're an RTO that delivers traineeships, you are engaging with employers. If you are developing training and assessment specifically for an organisation where you're training their team members, then you should be completing these surveys um, as well. I've got a Q&A, definitely new for me, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool, uh, that's good. Um, you should be able to pop uh, questions in the chat as well. So, uh, so if you have any questions or comments or feedback. So your quality indicator reports are to be submitted uh, by the end of this month and you email it to qidata at asqua.gov.au. Uh, and the data should be from the 1st of January 2020 to the 31st of December 2020. So this is the 2020 data that you are submitting. So this is everybody who completed training in that 2020 year and getting feedback surveys following their completion of training. Um, and failure, normally failure to submit is a non-compliance and there is normally a fine or a risk of uh, cancellation of your registration. But as I said earlier, ASQA are being lenient on this uh, this year. So uh, due to COVID, uh, won't be going on in ongoing years. Um, okay, all right. So I'm just gonna stop sharing my PowerPoint and I'm 
got some, I'm going to go through some of the documents. So, uh, where are we? Okay. Uh, sorry, here we go. Okay, so this is the learner questionnaire. So you should be distributing this to 100% um, of your students and then taking that feedback uh, and then implementing it as um, opportunities for improvement. Now, I do, I have had people ask me before, do we have to do this survey? It doesn't really serve us as an RTO. There are better quality questions that we could ask. Do we have to do this one? Yes, you do. It is a requirement of the standards that you must complete the learner survey. So it is a requirement to do that and you will need to make sure that you've got it um, in place when you're submitting uh, for your feedback. Now, however, you can add other surveys. So if you want to do a survey based on marketing um, or where did the student come from, uh, how did they hear about you, you can do surveys like that and you can add additional questions to your survey. I've also been asked, can we turn the learner questionnaire into a document that can go onto like SurveyMonkey or something like that? You, you can do that, but the problem is, is you've also got to put in the instructions and it's a bit of an outline about why are they doing this? And you've got, to, you've got to get all these questions answered too. So you can put all of those in, uh, but you need to put, uh, make sure that you're collecting all of the data. So that's really, really important. And what you can, can do is also add additional questions in the survey if you wanted to do that. We also have the employer survey. So this is the questions that employers, uh, you can send to them. Um, it's not as involved, so you could quite easily convert this into a survey monkey if you wanted to do it that way. Um, but what's really important is these guides. So it's a learner survey guide uh, that gives you information about what is the survey, um, how to manage that feedback, what are you doing with continuous improvement. Now you can use this to give to your students. Um, you can also give, there's one for employers as well that you could also use. So this is the employer one that has all of that feedback. Um, for all um, our Vivacity members, you can access these. I'll put links on from today into the Facebook group. So the Vivacity Facebook group. So everything that we have discussed today, um, I'll put into the Facebook group and you'll be able to access it there. So I can get these to move out of the way. Um, so I'm just gonna get that link for you so that you can uh, pop it into the Facebook group. Uh, if you have not joined the Facebook group, highly recommend that you do because that is where all of the good stuff happens. It's where we do um, all of the uh, latest chats, information about the training industry, updates from Vivacity, updates from the vet sector, uh, there's lots of uh, good information in there that you can access. So here is the link to the Facebook group. If you're not a member yet, please join as a member. So you just click on the link, sign into Facebook, uh, and then you ask to be a member, and then we'll add you as a member. So we put lots of important updates in the Facebook group that doesn't go anywhere else. And we don't do it in an email. And the reason why is we don't want to fill your inbox with lots of emails that you may or may not get to. So it's really important that you are going to the Facebook group so that you can get the latest updates. And we've got some great interaction happening in the Facebook group as well. We've also had, um, and I do really encourage you, if you have not been to the Vivacity Mastermind yet, uh, the Mastermind is every Monday at 10.30 a.m., highly recommend you get onto the Mastermind because the Mastermind is where we're getting the results and we're seeing lots of results from our clients who are attending the Masterminds regularly, such as I had a message last month from one of our clients who was looking at shutting down her RTO only a year and a half ago, who sent me a message and said, last month we had our biggest month ever. We took 
over $500,000 in the month. Is that good for an RTO? And I said, hell yeah, uh, that's actually fantastic um, and a really, really good result. And she has put that down to attending the masterminds, doing the job trainer training, and also the coaching that we've been giving her to help her grow and scale her business. So if you have not attended the mastermind or it's been a while since you've attended the mastermind, highly recommend you get onto it because there's some great information that's coming out of the mastermind and it's helping so many RTOs to grow and scale their business. And it's the one thing that really makes us unique compared to any other RTO consultant out there. There are no other, we just conducted a competitor analysis of all of our competitors and no one comes anywhere near what we do in our membership program. There are so many benefits as a member that I would like to highlight for you, but we don't have time for it today that you really need to be taking advantage of. And that's one thing is getting on the mastermind and getting onto the Facebook group. Anyway, so back to uh, the quality indicators. So one of the things that I wanted to show you is what you need to do when you're uh, completing the survey. So where I'm actually going to bring up the survey. So the quality indicator uh, summary report is a Word document. So you'll be completing a Word document um, with a, a summary of all of the data that you've collected. Now, this is all you submit. You just submit this document. You don't submit all the forms or the surveys that you've received. You just submit this uh, survey um, feedback. So the idea is, is that you uh, go in, you put all your, your RTO details in there. How many surveys were issued? How many were received back? and what was the percentage of the results. So I've given you an example here, 567 uh, were distributed, 423 came back, and we had a 74% uh, ranking of, uh, join the group, also good work, Michael, um, uh, that you can, then this is to give an indicator of what the feedback is and how much of that feedback are you getting back. So it's, Really important, they, they're using, ASK was using this as a summary data to identify where is the feedback coming from and how much are you getting back. Um, this is going to change. The quality indicator survey is going to change in the new standards. Yay! Uh, there are so many people who find this such a headache to do and it's not relevant to RTOs. So it will be changing in the new standards. If you haven't heard, if you haven't been to the mastermind, um, we there is a vet reform going on at the moment and all of the standards are being rewritten as we speak and there are draft standards coming out in August and we'll be holding a vet reform uh, focus group looking at the new stand, proposed standards and what the impact that will have on your RTO. So I highly recommend uh, that you get on the mastermind because we give you updates about what's happening with the vet reform as well on a weekly basis. So you're keeping up to date on a weekly basis. Okay, so then on the survey form, you need to put trends of the response of those statistics. So um, are you getting more responses? Are you getting less responses? What do you think it may be? Um, I foresee that there will be a lot of answers in here uh, for last year due to COVID this due to COVID that uh, the pandemic uh, caused a lot of people not to not be able to complete surveys or you had less amount of students than you had uh, the year before, or you might've had more, might've been just keeping up with uh, your job trainer uh, and keeping up with uh, getting your government funding out there. The next part is uh, survey information feedback. So what were the expected or unexpected findings from the survey feedback? So you could put, you know, you received a lot of feedback on the training we've been delivering and that was not highlighted within the survey. So I know people, uh, some of our clients have been giving feedback to um, ask for about the fact that the survey doesn't actually collect data that's relevant for the RTO. But you should also have a look at the feedback and what are the comments? Were there any opportunities for improvement? Were, was there trends that you identified with the survey? Uh, did you have an issue with a trainer? Did you have an issue with a venue? And what, are you, what have you done to improve your services based on that feedback? So what does the survey feedback tell you about your organization's performance? How do you believe you went? 
is there opportunities for improvement or do you think you just did really, really well? Um, and especially considering uh, what happened in the last 12 months. So the big thing is with this survey is not necessarily um, as we are going to use it against you or anything like that. They want to see the feedback that you're getting so that they can improve their practices and that also helps them to identify where to put the government funding as well. So this is the important part. What improvement actions have you implemented? So what preventative or corrective actions have you implemented in response to the feedback? So it could be um, something to do about a trainer or a venue or the way you're delivering the training, what's happened with the assessments and how you can improve that. So it's really looking at, okay, what could you prevent in future? What corrective actions or opportunities for improvement can you do? And then how will you monitor the effectiveness of that improvement within your um, RTO? So we actually have within the uh, policies and procedures for continuous improvement under clause 2.2, we actually have a whole process on how to uh, manage your continuous improvement. So I highly recommend that you get onto uh, the policy and procedure manual for opportunities for improvement, because we actually have the whole process of what to do with the feedback and how to improve your practices based on that feedback that you've received. Okay, that is that one. So let's get on to our subject for today, which is uh, complaints and appeals. So we'll just share this one and get back onto that PowerPoint. Any questions about quality indicators? Any questions you may have about that? Pop them in the chat. If you do, um, if not, we'll just continue on uh, with our uh, complaints and appeals. Okay, awesome. All right, doesn't look like we have any. Okay, so this month we're looking at complaints and appeals. This is an area where it's really important that you're making sure that you're managing your complaints and appeals so that the complaints are coming through you as an RTO and students aren't going direct to ASWA because the last thing you want is a complaint to go directly to ASWA because ASWA have to respond to 100% of any complaints received. So one of the first questions that ASWA, get asked, uh, ASWA asks when someone submits a complaint is have you submitted a complaint about the RTO to the RTO first? And if they say no, they haven't, then it redirects them to go back to the RTO to submit a complaint there. But what we have found what often happens is the student doesn't want to do that or they don't know how to or it's too hard. Uh, they just go back and redo the complaint submission again and just say yes this time um, and then uh, continue on with uh, their submission of the complaint. So you really don't want to uh, make it difficult for students to be able to submit a complaint. You want to make it easy for them to be able to submit a complaint to you so that you can take remedial action and actually have identified opportunities for improvement from that. So what's the difference between a complaint and appeal? A complaint is where a student wishes to raise a complaint about another student, maybe a trainer, the RTO, it could be a third party, um, or it could be where a team member within your RTO wants to make a complaint about um, someone else in the organisation as well. So it's it's a complaint that is you're dis expressing your discontent about the RTO process and systems and looking at opportunities for improvement as an RTO. An appeal is where a student disagrees with the result that they've received for a unit of competency. So it could be that they were deemed not yet competent um, and they disagree with that result. So they can appeal that result and ask to be reassessed. So this is where we've got to make sure that we've got the process in place to manage this. So within the standards, it's very much about how are you going to look after the students and protect the students and inform them of their right to be able to submit a complaint. So it's really looking at your whole complaints and appeals process and how are your students able to submit complaints to you to improve your practices. So it's really looking at, well, what is your process? 
So if you go into the QNC manual, you'll see that we have a whole process for complaints and appeals, which is also in the student handbook, which makes it really clear to the student how to submit a complaint. If you're not using the Vivacity student handbook, I highly recommend that you do. Um, also the QNC manual because the student handbook has been written to be compliant and it's got through every single audit for the last three years. We haven't had any issues or non-compliances. What's going to be a massive change that's going to happen, as I talked about earlier, is the VET reform. All of the standards are going to change. So all of your policies and procedures are also going to change to reflect the new standards. So now more than ever, it's really important that you're getting along to the Vivacity Mastermind, you're getting along to the Vivacity Training, because we're going to keep you informed and up to date with what are the changes that are going to happen, and even what we foresee are going to be the changes that are going to happen um, to, that will impact your RTO and how we can minimise the impact of that RTO. Within the QNC manual and the student handbook, we have a flow chart for complaints and appeals. So it's a process for the student to be able to submit a complaint and then it's a fair and just process. And what makes it a fair and just process is we have timeframes around when they submit a complaint and that process for uh, the complaint process. How are that, when are they going to be contacted? Uh, they get a confirmation that you've received the complaint uh, and that you're keeping them up to date with what's going on uh, with the complaint on an ongoing basis. And this is one of the really important parts of uh, complaints and appeals is making sure you're keeping the student up to date. Um, you're also responsible for any third parties as well, where they may want to make a complaint about a third party. So a third party could be another RTO provider who's delivering training on your behalf. It could be a work placement, where, so the employer or a supervisor within a work placement, um, or it could be someone else that you get into your RTO to help with delivery of training. So it's really important that it's clear how to submit a complaint. Okay, so um, under standard 6.3, it's all about that procedural uh, process. And the big thing is making sure that your complaints and appeals policy and procedure is publicly available. What that means is on your website. So you need to have a page or a link on your website that includes your complaints and appeals policy and procedure. Now, you... If you have got your student handbook on your website, then the complaints and appeals policy and procedure is publicly available because it's in your student handbook. So that is two ways that you can have it very easily publicly available. You can also have a mechanism where students can submit a complaint through um, your, your website as well. So that's another opportunity that you could do. Now, one of the big things is, is in writing, you acknowledge that you've received a complaint and that you're keeping a monitor of that complaint um, on behalf of the student. And that you make sure that you securely maintain any of those complaints and that could be through a password protected uh, database. So you could have it on there. Okay, all right. So within the QNC manual, you'll see we have the process in there. Um, and the big part about complaints and appeals is really looking at plan, do, check, act. So identifying the problem and how can you minimise the risk of this happening again? Uh, that's a big thing. Um, and how can you um, make sure that you have systems and practices in place to improve your practices? Um, you should also implement a opportunity for improvement form. So we have those within the policies and procedures and check that the opportunity for improvement worked and review the data to identify, you know, did it work? Were we able to improve our practices? You need to be monitoring that to ensure that it is actually being implemented. Um, and if it's worked, standardize the opportunity for improvement. If not, identify that what the next problem should be and repeat the process again. Okay, there are five elements of effective complaints handling. So it's really looking at the culture so you need to look at the culture of your students, the organisation, uh, where they're coming from, what are they doing, um, how, what is the culture within your organisation, and then making sure that you're addressing that culture when you're looking at your complaints handling process. It's also the principles and that system that you have in place for managing your complaints and appeals. 
Um, and who are the people who will be looking after the complaints? What are the types of people that you should have within that role? And then making sure that you've got a process and everyone knows how to follow the process and then analyze the results of that complaint and appeal. So we're just gonna break this down. So culture, um, this could be anything within your organization. Um, and it really does highlight when you receive complaints and appeals, it really does highlight what are the weaknesses within your organization. So I always see a complaint as an opportunity for improvement because it's someone giving you feedback that you could use to improve your practices throughout your organization. So what are you going to do to take on this feedback and improve your practices based on that feedback. So the principles, a complaint handling system is modeled on principles of fairness and accessibility. And it's very much the process that are within the standards is that fair and just process. What makes a fair and just process? Well, it's being clear, what is your complaints and appeals process? How do we submit a complaint? Um, what are the steps? How, am I, how is my complaint being acknowledged? and what will be the process and making sure that they're well informed of the whole process. People. So this is looking at the people who will be handling the complaints. And you've got to think about who is the right person on your team to be managing complaints. They really should be a people person, someone who is a very good listener and someone that is able to handle that process and not take it personally. Because complaints aren't about personal things generally. It's generally about the systems and process and, and perhaps maybe not the team following that or not having the systems and processes in place. So you want to make sure that you've got the right person there who is the person that the student is to go to to make a complaint. And that may not be you. It might be someone else within your organisation. So you really need to think about where should your complaints go. We have a very strict process that's in the policies and procedures for managing your uh, complaints process. So there's seven stages. So the complaint must be acknowledged within five days of the complaint being submitted. The complaint should be assessed and assigned a priority. So with a high, medium or low. Um, if an investigation is required, it should be planned. What is that investigation? Who do you need to speak to? Are there any other third parties involved that you need to go to? Do you need to have a sit down meeting with the student and maybe a trainer? Um, what is the process that you're going to put in place? The investigation should resolve factual issues and consider options for complainant resolution. Um, the resolution should be very clear and, and the process should be very informative and keeping them up to date. If you're doing that, you're gonna have less amount of complaints about the complaint, which we don't want about that. Um, and if a student's getting annoyed about a complaint process and it's not getting followed up, they're, they're more likely to go to ASLA and submit a complaint to ASLA. So um, if the complainant is not satisfied with the result, an internal review should be looked at and looking at your processes and how you can improve your practices. Um, and looking at, it, are there any systemic issues within your process that needs to be improved? So element five is analysis. So this is really looking at what was the complaint? How does it impact your other students, this student, other students, trainers and assessors, third parties, employers, um, and what is that impact? And how can uh, highlighting this, the failings in this, can be rem remedied and how can you uh, identify opportunities for improvement to minimize the risk of this happening again. And that's what ASPA are mainly concerned about when they're auditing this is your process for minimizing the risk. Now, the big thing is with a complaint, you could have a complaint that goes to ASPA about uh, the standards. So if you're non-compliant with any of the standards, a student can make a complaint uh, to ask her about that and ask her are really going to want to know about those. The other one is trainers and particularly disgruntled trainers who may have left the RTO, um, they may put a complaint in as well, whether it's valid or not. Um, so you've got to be really careful with what your process is for monitoring that. Um, it could also be a complaint by an employer, so where they have had uh, a, they've employed someone who did training with your organisation and they don't have sufficient skills and knowledge to be able to do the work that 
their certificate says that they can do. So um, I've seen lots of different types of complaints. Uh, anything that goes to ASFA, they need to 100% that all of them, they've got to investigate. Uh, so that is their process. So you really want to look at if you receive a complaint, what can you do to improve your practices to ensure that this doesn't happen again? And really look at the trends within your organisation. Is this the first time that this complaint has been raised? Um, are there other students out there who may have the same complaint but just haven't said anything yet? So it might be something else you need to look into about how are you best serving your clients. So let's have a look at some case studies. So this is a case study one. So XYZ RTO receives a complaint from one, an international student who enrolled through an agent into BSB 6015 Advanced Diploma of Business. Juan's complaint states that the agent did not inform him that he needed to attend any classes. So if you think about this, their complaint is, so uh, the student has said, well, I wasn't told that, my, that I was supposed to attend any classes. In fact, my agent said that I just enroll and I don't have to turn up for anything. Now, this is a big issue with international students where you need to make sure that you're keeping on top of that and you're surveying your students following enrolment on what did the agent say? What were, did they guarantee you anything? Um, and how, and making sure that they didn't tell you something that is not correct about what your services provide. So anybody who's delivering international uh, training for international students, you would know that there are a minimum of 20 hours face-to-face -face training that's required uh, for the training. So if an agent's told them that they don't need to turn up, uh, then that's a major non-compliance. So Juan's complaint. After you have acknowledged Juan's complaint, the next step is to begin investigating. You should speak to Juan, the agent, and any other student who was referred by the same agent. The complaint with the result in one or of two outcomes, substantiated or unsubstantiated. If unsubstantiated, your investigation identifies that Juan was fully informed of the requirement to attend class. Uh, the outcome is stated in writing within 10 days of the decision and one is provided with information about the appeals process and contact details for the ombudsman. Um, if substantiated, it is likely you would be, terminate the agent agreement and I would really be looking at what is the agent actually saying to your students before they uh, attend your RTO. So you really wanna look at that process and what are the options for refunds and attending the scheduled classes. Okay, so that's an example of a complaint. So let's have a look at an appeal. So XYZ Training has provided Lolita, an international student, with a letter stating their intent to report her for unsatisfactory course attendance. Lolita appeals the decision as soon as she receives the letter. With her appeal, she includes a medical certificate from the local hospital, which shows she had been admitted for the whole period of the classes she missed. Uh, MB, an appeal may either revoke, remove, or affirm, agree with the decision. So with the result of this, um, when you look at this, sorry, uh, yes, yeah, so Tony uh, repeals a result. Uh, sorry, that's not that one. So with that one, they've got a reason why they weren't able to attend classes. So you should go back with a response of um, what's the action you're going to take and you need to do an intervention plan because you're going to need to change their training schedule. So you'll need to have a look at that whole process and have a meeting with the student. Okay, here's another case study. Tony appeals a result. You are an academic manager at XYZ RTO. Receive an assessment appeal from Tony. Uh, could be an international student or um, a domestic student who was deemed not yet competent for the unit BSB 401 make a presentation as he was absent the day the presentation was scheduled. So um, he wants to appeal the result um, and this could be an opportunity where they may want to be reassessed. So it's really looking at, okay, what is your process? What can you do? Um, are they able to do a reassessment at another later time? Um, and it could be an intervention plan or something like that that you're doing with the student as well. Okay, so that's complaints and appeals. What's different with uh, CRICOS? So um, with CRICOS, it's very similar. You've got the same process 
um, with uh, as with RTOs, um, but it's making sure that you're recording those complaints and that whole process and there's no fee. It's got to be clear that there's no fee for processing a complaint. Um, and the main difference, so I'll just get to that, uh, you've got your appeal process. The main difference is um, the ombudsman. So with the international students, the uh, students don't have uh, the same rights as domestic students where they can go to fair work and fair trading and things like that. They have their own um, ombudsman uh, where they can submit a complaint directly to the ombudsman and it offers a free and un unbiased complaint service. Uh, students can opt for an interpreter free of charge through this service um, and they can submit the complaint directly there. Now in your policies and procedures for international students it should be um, the ombudsman.gov.au. For domestic students, it's training complaints hotline. So it's actually in the QNC manual. We've already got the links in there, uh, but there is the training complaints hotline. I have seen this only just recently where uh, there are policies and procedures out there that still refer to the students to go to ASQA to submit a complaint. ASPA don't want to receive the complaints directly. They want you to go through the complaint, training complaints hotline and they want you to be promoting that within your policies and procedures and not go directly to ASPA. They've got enough to handle. Um, the training complaints hotline has been specifically set up to deal with complaints about training providers uh, for domestic market. So this one, the ombudsman is for international, uh, that one's for the domestic market. So I do recommend that you have that in there. All right, that is it for today. Any questions about complaints and appeals? Any concerns that you would like to brainstorm? Because I'm definitely here to be able to do that. Um, or any other questions that you may have about vivacity or about what's happening in the industry at the moment. Um, I've got a little bit of time so we can answer those questions. Um, we've got some great opportunities that are coming up in the training uh, with vivacity. So I highly recommend uh, you guys get onto, um, onto this training uh, because there's so many great opportunities uh, with what we're doing uh, and learning what our, our clients are learning as well. Um, if you're a trainer assessor, uh, we have coming up a trainer's matrix workshop. So we're going to be delivering a trainer's matrix workshop. So it's a workshop that will go from, you'll be taught how to do it and you will implement, you'll write your staff matrix during the workshop. It will be a six hour workshop and by the end of the workshop you will have a completed staff matrix. So we'll also be preparing you with lots of information about what you need to have in place before the workshop. At this stage we're looking at early July that we'll be delivering the workshop. All of our members will be sending you an invite. Um, all members get to do the course as part of their membership and that includes all of their trainers with every RTO gets to do this workshop for as part of their membership. We will be charging for external RTOs and trainers and assessors. So I highly recommend if you're a trainer assessor or if you have some trainers and assessors that you get in contact with them and that you let us know that you are keen. If you are keen, can you just put a yes in the chat? Um, if, you, if you have a team of trainers that you would like to attend, if you can put yes in caps, yes in caps in the chat, uh, because I'd love to see who on here would like to attend this training. So it's a trainers matrix workshop where at the end of the workshop, you'll have all of your trainers will have a completed trainers matrix. We've got a yes in caps. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we've got a yes from Krista. Good, excellent. Um, even if you're a newbie, you can also uh, do this training as well. I'd like them to do it, but could not manage to have six hours available. So um, this is why I'm getting feedback now. What about two, three hour sessions? 
two, three hour sessions. We could do it that way um, as well. Yes, with one trainer, yes. Um, so I could break it up into two, three hour sessions where we could do it maybe a week apart. Uh, that would be better. Yep, okay, cool. This is the feedback I need because I haven't actually said it, um, the date yet. I just know that there's people out there who want it. Um, for us, it makes our life easier if our clients have all of their trainers do this training because we know we'll go to audit compliant. <laughs> so that's yes to the two times three hours. Okay, awesome, awesome. We can definitely do that. Um, I'm looking at a Friday at the moment, but what I could do is two different days. So if you can make one, you might be able to make one or the other. Um, we will be recording it, but I do recommend they get on live. And the reason why is because they can ask questions and I'll be able to answer them. So we're going to be doing it um, as a live thing so that those questions can be answered. And I'll be doing going through the actual staff matrix line by line, exactly what they need to do and what is an ideal resume, what needs to be on the resume, what is evidence of currency, what is ever evidence of PD. Um, and we'll be going through all of that and how to apply it into the into the staff matrix. So um, very good. Okay, so we've got. Uh, uh, quite a few yeses for two, three hour sessions. So we can definitely do that two, three hour sessions um, and they will be recorded. So we'll be recording these sessions. Um, you can do the recording, but I would move, if I was you, move whatever you can, move a mountain to get your trainers to come to this training because when we're, it's just a one-off at the moment that we're doing. Um, we're just trying to solve a problem that we have seen um, out there when we're doing our audits. And it's really the trainers and assessors not understanding what needs to go into a staff matrix. So uh, that's what we're gonna be really focused on is what needs to go in there. So awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so we'll be letting you know uh, when the session will be coming on the Facebook group. So if you haven't joined the Facebook group, um, or you haven't been on there for a while, recommend that you get on there uh, because I will be doing a survey on there as well about the Trainers Matrix workshop uh, because I'm, I, first of all, I want to meet our client um, requirements. We have already had about 150 people who are not clients who are keen to go. So we've got a lot of people who are very interested in this workshop. Um, it will only be recorded for members. So uh, for everyone else, they have to come to the live workshop. So we will be doing, uh, and I think the two, three hour sessions is the best way to go. All right, so if you haven't joined the Facebook group yet, please get on. Anybody who is a member, uh, even under the RTO, you can join the Facebook group. So it's a Facebook group exclusive to Vivacity members only. No one else can go on there. They have to be a Vivacity member. And we verify that before we let anybody in. So you won't be having any randoms. There will be definitely no one doing any marketing or um, spamming you. Uh, it is very much information specifically. Just think about it. You get to have a room with vivacity and an outstanding group of vet professionals around Australia. So it's a great opportunity for you to network and our clients have been getting some amazing um, feedback and results from attending that. Okay, the next webinar is the 7th of July. Can you believe we're halfway through the year? Uh, 7th of July, and we will be going through third party arrangements. And there's lots of stuff that you need to know about this. Um, hopefully we might know some things about the standards that are coming out, uh, but I know that this is going to be a focus in the new standards that come out. Um, will be around third party. So it'll be lots of uh, great information about third party arrangements. This ties in really well with education agents because education agents are also third parties. So we'll be combining those two together. So I highly recommend you get onto that webinar uh, next month. Thank you very much everyone for attending today's webinar. So nice to see so many people online. We've got up to 15 today, so awesome. Uh, love to see you at the Mastermind. And also don't forget that we have the workshop on Wednesday, which is all about, it's a Mastermind on the eight critical drivers to RTO success. And we're going to be doing SEO and marketing. And we have a special guest speaker 
who is coming along to the mastermind to give you key tips for SEO organic on your website, but also SEO Google ads, uh, and looking at how you can improve your marketing for your RTO, very RTO specific. Um, this Wednesday, 10 a.m., uh, whoever is the main account holder for Vivacity membership would have received an invitation. So if you want to go, you need to get in contact with us and let us know.